One of the core building blocks of programming is variables. A variable is a name in our program that can hold values. In C++, every variable has an associated type and can hold only values of that type. The primitive types that come with the language are shown here. Integral types hold integers or whole numbers. Floating point types hold fractional numbers or decimal values. A Boolean variable holds only the values true or false. And a character is a special kind of integral type where the numbers it holds are mapped to individual written characters used for text. These types also have sizes associated with them, which tell us how many bits are used to store that type of value in the computer's memory. For integral types, more bits means we can save bigger numbers. So while a 16-bit int maxes out at 65,536, a 32-bit int can hold numbers over 2 billion. For integers, there are two ways you'll see the size of the type indicated. The first uses the keywords short, long, and even long, long. These keywords can either decorate the int type or stand on their own and represent approximate sizes. For example, a variable declared with the type short will use at least 16 bits of storage, though it may use more under the hood. The other way uses special type names that exactly specify the size of the type. Int 8t, for example, will use exactly 8 bits to store its value. These so-called fixed width types are generally preferred if you actually care about the size of your variables. The other property an integral type can have is whether it is signed or unsigned. Signed types can hold negative numbers. Unsigned types cannot represent negative numbers, but can hold larger positive values. The max value a signed type can use is generally half as big as that of an unsigned type of the same size. Ints default to signed, so you'll have to use the unsigned keyword to get an unsigned int. There are also variations of our fixed width type names that represent unsigned values and start with the letter U. For floating point values, there are three sizes available with the names float, double, and long double. These use 32, 64, and 128 bits respectively. Larger floating point types offer greater max values and decimal precision at the cost of consuming more memory. Finally, character types are special and frankly can get pretty complicated. You'll see them used most commonly in a few ways. First, as types used to represent individual bytes. This is most common in old code written before the fixed width types existed. At the time, char and unsigned char were the best way to say, I want to hold one byte. When it comes to representing text, most of the text we'll be dealing with uses the ASCII encoding that fits each letter or other character into a single char variable. An array of char variables can then represent a complete block of readable text. There are also wide characters and fixed width character types. These are used when more advanced text encodings are needed, such as Unicode, which makes emojis possible. We're not going to get into any of the details of how that works. Just know that if you see code using the wchart type, for example, it's still working with text data, just with a different encoding. Now, creating a new variable involves answering three questions. What type of data will our variable hold? What will our variable's name be? And what value should it start with? We tell our computer all of that through a variable declaration statement, like this one. The first part is our variable's type. This can be any of the primitive types we've discussed so far, or a class type for objects, which we'll talk about later. The next part is our variable's name. This can be any combination of letters, numbers, and underscores, as long as it doesn't start with a number. The last part of this statement initializes the variable. There are many intricate rules to how initialization works in C++. It's something that has evolved as the language has matured. We're not going to cover all of the details right now. It's enough to recognize that these three statements all initialize our variable with the same value. Each syntax follows slightly different rules that become more relevant when you start working with non-primitive types. But even then, you don't usually have to worry about the details unless you're doing something very specific. Now, the way we change the values in a variable is by using operators. The simplest of these operators, at least conceptually, is the assignment operator. We can write the name of an existing variable, then the equal sign, and then an expression that evaluates to a value of the variable's type. This could be a literal, as in another number or letter, or the name of another variable if we want to copy its value. Once this line executes, our variable now holds the new value. We can, of course, do more than just assign new hard-coded numbers to our variables. All of the common arithmetic operators also exist in C++. We can add, subtract, multiply, and divide numbers, and much more. 
There are even bitwise operators that apply logical rules to the individual ones and zeros in our variables. There are assignment variations of most of these operators, so we can write a line like this that takes the value of a, multiplies it by 10, and saves the new number back into a. Other special arithmetic operators of note are the increment and decrement operators. These adjust a number up or down by one. You get two versions of each that operate slightly differently. A post increment will add one to the value, but returns the original value before the addition. A pre increment will add one to the value and return the new value. The pre and post decrement operators do the same thing, but subtract one instead. While the distinction between pre and post operators is important, these most commonly appear as complete statements where the return values aren't actually used. So in practice, they can sometimes be interchangeable. We're not going to cover all of the details of every available operator right now, but they are well documented on cppreference.com if you want to get to know the whole set. Finally, it's important to know that we can chain multiple operators together. When an expression includes multiple operators, like this one, the operator precedence rules tell us which operators are evaluated first. For example, multiplication is ordered before addition, so the result of this expression is 5. Remembering the exact precedence rules can sometimes be difficult, so it's usually better to be explicit about the ordering you're expecting. We can do this by adding parentheses to our expression. By adding parentheses here, we've told the computer to evaluate the addition before the multiplication, so our result is now 6. That's all for this video. We've learned about variables, data types, and operators. The rest of our topics will build on these concepts.